So let's try tracing some code that uses pointers. And so as usual, we'll start ourselves off at the beginning of main at line number uh, 13, and we'll draw ourselves a nice scoping box for main. There we go. And on line number 13, we create ourselves a variable. So there's x, and on line 14, I'll just get a step ahead here, we create y. So there's x and y, x has the value 6, y has the value 0. Now I've tailored this example to demonstrate the difference between um, what we've already been doing with function calls, where we pass a value in and the function gets a photocopy, versus what we can do if we pass in a pointer. The key thing to understand is that in C, when you pass something into a function, you are always passing by value. All you hand over is a value, and the function gets its own copy of that. Um, other languages have the concept of something called pass by reference, where you can hand over to the function your original, but C actually doesn't. We'll discover though that we can sort of simulate pass by reference by passing a pointer, even though the pointer itself, as we'll see in a few minutes, gets passed by value. So line number 15, we generate our first line of output. We're inside the scope of main, we print out x equals, well x in this case is 6, and y equals 0. Okay, so then we call a function f. So I'll set up a scoping box for f. We're sitting on line number 16 now. I'll set up a scoping box for f, there it is. And f takes one argument whose name happens to be x. And then I've got to resolve the call itself. So here's my function call. Before I can actually actuate that, I've got to replace uh, the expression in the brackets with the actual value of y, which is 0. And then 0 becomes the argument passed in here. So it becomes the value of x in the function. OK, so x is 0. All right, so then uh, I'm ready to start executing f. And I go to line number 2. And line number 2 says x equals 10. OK, so I'm in the scope of f, and I set x to 10. Great. And then I return the value 1 million. That's weird, because down here where I call the function, I don't even use the return value. But that's allowed. We've seen all semester printf has been returning us values, and we've never touched them. Um, and so it's perfectly valid to call a function and then ignore its return value. So f returns the value 1 million, which means we go over here and we replace the call to f with the return value. Not that it makes very much of a difference to us, because it never even gets assigned to anything. And then we wipe out the scope of f. So it is gone. All right, so line 16, well, we, that value 1 million just gets sort of thrown away. And then line 17, we print out x and y again. So I'm back in the scope of main. x equals 6 still, and y equals 0. Now, we won't fall for this trap these days, I hope, because we know by now that, yes, it's true, f had a variable called x, but f has its own variable called x. That's one of its personal belongings. The variable called x in main still belongs to main, and it's still separate. So the fact that the output has two lines that are the same shouldn't surprise us that much. OK, line 18, we call g. So before I do the call, I'll replace the arguments with their actual values. There we go, 6 and 0. And then those will become the two arguments that get passed into G. But of course, to, first I have to set up a, a scoping box for G. There it is. And G has two arguments, X and Y. OK, that's a bit flashy. Let's just clean that up. Um, and the first argument gets the value 0, or sorry, 6. It ends up being the argument x, and then the second argument is 0, and that gets assigned to y. All right, line number 6, the first line of g. Well, that sets x to 100. OK, fair enough. I'm in the scope of g, and so I set the variable x to have the value 100. OK, and then line number 7, set y to be equal to 600. OK, so this is also sort of a red herring, because we know that g has its own variables called x and y. It never does anything with them after this, and then the function ends on line 8, and g doesn't even return a value. So we go in and destroy the scope of g, and then that's the end of that. We go back to line number 19. We're back in the scope of main. We can see that even though g had variables x and y, they weren't the same ones that main had. And so on line 19, we print out again x equals 6, y equals 0. OK, so all of this up until this point was just review of the way that function calls and pass by value work. Uh, and we know that a function can have variables that happen to share a name with variables outside the function, but the function's um, variables are its own personal property. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the ones in main don't get modified. But now I'm going to call this function h. So let's set up a scoping box for h. All right, there it is. 
So I set up a scoping box for H and I have to create on the, uh, in the box, I have to create a local variable for every one of the parameters that H takes. And it takes one parameter P of type int star. And I'm just now noticing a little um, interesting typo thing. It's not really a typo because this is allowed. It turns out that when you use a pointer type, you are allowed to put the star on either side of the space. And it's this usual thing in C where white space isn't a big deal. So these two variables here are exactly the same. It's just a question of personal taste, which way they get declared. And when I teach programming, of course, I like to make sure that the star is up against the type, so int star. But actually, often in, in the real world, I might use a notation like this, and it even slipped through today. So uh, both of those notations are valid, although I generally encourage people to write it as int star with the, the star before the space. Okay, so H has one argument of type int star. What does it get assigned? So on line 20, when I'm calling H, I hand it an arrow pointing at x. So inside of main, this is x. So if I create an arrow pointing at x, I am giving somebody an arrow pointing at this thing. So what does h receive? h receives an arrow pointing at x. And you'll notice from inside of h, I now have the ability to exit the scope of h and go find a variable that belongs to somebody else. And so even though, just to be clear, the thing that I actually gave h is, a, is just a value. I just handed h an arrow, a copy of an arrow, in fact. But if I follow that arrow, um, I can get to one of main's private possessions, one of its variables. Okay, so I, I'm now ready to enter the scope of h. So um, I go to line number 10, and line number 10 says, take the value 10 and assign it to wherever you end up if you start at p and follow one arrow. Okay, so inside the scope of h, p is this thing. So I start at p, I follow one arrow, and I end up back here. And that means that I assign the value 10 to this thing. And then, of course, h ends. So line 11, h is over. So we destroy the scope for h. Um, and then I guess I've got to uh, do a little touch up here because there's some parts of the scope of h that have leaked outside. So we'll get rid of that arrow. Uh, okay, so h is now over and its scope has been destroyed and we're now on line 21. And so we print out x equals, uh, well, 10. Because h from inside of its scope was able to modify the value of x in main because main gave it explicit access to x by handing it that arrow. x equals 10, y equals zero. Okay, line 22, we're gonna call h again. So there's h. We know that h takes uh, one parameter of type int star, which is called p. And this time we're passing in arrow pointing at y. So at in the, where I'm making the call itself, I'm inside of main. And inside of main, this is what y is. So if I make an arrow pointing at y, I'm making an arrow pointing at this thing. And that is what I hand over to h. There it is. Inside of h, there is no such thing as y. H has no idea what this box is really called. H was just handed the end of an arrow that points in to this scope. So I'm now ready to start H. I've got this arrow pointing at Y. On line number 10, it says star P equals 10. Take the value 10 and assign it to wherever you end up if you start at P and follow an arrow. And that, of course, takes me here. And so the variable main inside of this, uh, sort of the variable Y inside of the scope of main now ends up with the value 10. And then just like before, H ends. So we, we, just like before, touch this up a bit. Get rid of the arrow. And then uh, we're back at line, at the end of line 22, and we're ready to execute line 23, which says x equals, well, x equals 10, and y equals 10. And the key here is that we're throwing around so many things, and it's so easy to have lots of variables in the program called x or y or whatever, that it's really important that we keep track of which x am I talking about at each step. And if I create an arrow to an x, even then, which x am I creating an arrow to? Even though h has no idea what x is, I can hand it an arrow to any variable that I am able to access inside of my current scope. On line 20 and line 22, inside of main, there are things called x and y. If I have something called x, I can make an arrow pointing at it. And I can then hand that arrow over to a function which gives it access to the private possessions inside of a different scope.